This is The Chris Abraham Show. I'm recording this afterwards. Uh, this is Chris Abraham, the Chris Abraham Show, season five, episode eight, and the title of the show is um, the contradiction between uh, humanitarianism and climatism, and the different goals between humanitarians and climatologists or people who believe that we need to work hard as humans to abate or mitigate or reverse uh, human created uh, climate change and global warming. Are they at odds with people who are trying to allow anybody born into the world to live a happy, empowered, healthy, long, successful, well-fed, non-diseased life with their own culture, their own agency, their own integrity and pride. Are those two things at odds? And if there is a Venn diagram overlap, what is that? We all know that uh, a large percentage of people in the world would not be alive without the aggressive intervention and mitigation from science, technology, medicine, and services, right? Uh, the technological innovation of food, distribution centers, uh, etc. So I'm going to go into that in the next segment. And the reason why I actually did this reintroduction is because I am so embarrassed that I forget that I forgot that Muslims worship at a mosque. So I was like, temple, no, church, it's not a Muslim church, no, Jews, they worship in temple, it's mosques. So when I, uh, I'm like, uh, comment dire, qu'est-ce que c'est le mot, uh, je ne sais pas, bleu, it's, the word is mosque, anyway, enjoy, and sorry about this. As you know, I am anti-professionalism. Right now, I'm hunkered over at the uh, community table in a very loud and boisterous Starbucks. I'm not at Ididos yet, but I needed to spread out and get some work done. So sometimes on the weekend, uh, Ididos is chock-a-block with weekend warriors. And I want that place to thrive, so I don't want a big, fat Chris Abraham taking up a seat in my thriving Ididos. Anyway, don't forget the Chris Abraham Show, Season 5, Episode 8. Mahalo and aloha. This is Chris Abraham intervening again uh, because I checked out. I asked, I'm putting this in before the before the bulk of the podcast, but I went in to chat GPT and asked it, chat GPT4, and I asked it, how many people would the earth support were it not for modern innovations and charity and altruism and uh, trade lines and load balancing and immigration, immigration and uh, important uh, medicine and uh, strategies for chronic and fatal diseases such as um, organ failure, uh, organ transplant, 
uh, diabetes one, diabetes two, uh, dialysis, and all these things. And um, Google uh, ChatGPT wouldn't tell me, but when I went over to Google Bard, which I think is bard.google.com, it told me hem ha hem ha hem ha. But likely the Earth would only be able to support one billion people. So that's the number that I put into the title. And I wanted to kind of put this in here now so that you could hear it before the rest of the episode. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Mahalo. Ciao. Hey there. Um, I'm sure if you've been listening to me for a while, you've realized that most of my podcasts are broken up into chunks. Well, since I haven't been monetized for like two years, I've decided just to make it one long segment without cute little uh, intermediary music breaks. So this is the Chris Abraham show. My name's Chris Abraham. I might be developing an ear infection in my left ear. So tomorrow... I will probably be going to the clinic. This is season uh, five, episode eight, I think. And it is uh, a non-controversial topic. The title is uh, Humanitarianism versus Climatism. And um, it will be about the fact that um, that humanitarianism and climatism are at odds and are at contradictory movements. And I wonder how it is going to shake out in the end. I'll explain that now. Hello, this is Chris Abraham. I am sitting in Penrose Square. I am sharing space with lots of other people. So you might hear mirth in the background. You might hear uh, city buses with diesel engines, like that one there. You might hear delivery trucks. You might hear fire engines. You might hear ambulances. You might hear garbage trucks. You might hear diesel 18-wheelers. And you might hear those giant uh, construction dump trucks. Like, not the Tonka dump trucks, but the ones that have those giant beds that carry around uh, refuse soil. I am uh, just had my one breakfast today. I basically ate enough protein and fat to cover my entire calorie requirements for the day, so I will not eat any more. It is 1036 on Sunday, April 16th. Um, uh, my bloody ear is bothering me. I hope it heals on its own, but we all know that those kinds of things do not heal on their own. Um, So I'm probably going to need antibiotic eardrops. Bloody hell. Um, All right, so we have, what is it, 8 million people globally? And the only reason we have 8 million people globally is because the quality of life standards and all the breaks towards overpopulation have been have been uh, solved through technology and um, load balancing generosity over across the globe right Um, there are huge number of people who are developing and you know you can develop medicines all you want but if you do not provide Um, if you do not provide uh, um, vaccines, if you don't provide uh, mitigations, if you don't provide um, antibiotics, if you don't provide hydration, if you don't provide um, various and sundry anti-malaria medicines and so forth, netting, etc. Natural processes of 
destroying and breaking and collapsing populations would have naturally occurred, which might well have easily at least plateaued um, the world's population. So without human health technologies at an ever fast rate, at a faster rate, um, there quite possibly would have been uh, incredibly higher numbers of, uh, of uh, childhood um, and um, pregnancy deaths. There would have been fatalities. There would have been way more people dying from easily uh, fixable diseases. And even, even in America, the universal vaccination and all these other things. This is what I call the humanitarian mission. And the human humanitarian mission is incredibly noble. We're keeping more people alive who would quickly die to the normal slings and arrows of living in the world were it not for the constant, persistent, and rich injection of technology, medicine, support, food, and water, clean water. So, and I'm saying that for Americans and Western people too. People with diabetes would die. People who, um, with, without universal free dialysis in many of the world's countries, um, with universal free dialysis, so many people uh, would die. Without cancer treatment, people would die. Um, dying is a persistent issue. And were it not for global humanist, humanitarian, altruistic, <laughs> and even GASP, uh, faith-based missions there would be probably, I don't know what the number is, I will ask GPT what the population of the earth will be, would be if it did not have modern, not only just modern medicine and technology, but uh, supply chains, donations, altruisms, support, missions, ministry, doctors without borders, cleft palate missions, um, missions from the Gates Foundation to try to prevent uh, COVID and um, and uh, 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 waterborne um, and uh, mosquito-borne illnesses. I guarantee. I bet you. Like I don't. I don't reckon to say what it is, but I reckon that maybe we would have a population of five to six million uh, billion people globally. It would be sadly. It would be um, probably skewed towards uh, the first world and the second world maybe but I mean it, nobody's ever stopped people from having babies right so I would say that probably people might like the argument amongst humanitarians is that the empowerment of women uh, the, prov the provision for um, women's health care such as abortions and and um, um, uh, things like, you know, condoms and the pill and so forth, prophylactics, prophylaxis, um, make it easier for women to avoid having as many kids and the humanitarian efforts for keeping children, keeping the birth rate higher from successful births and not child deaths childbirth deaths, higher incidence of, what is it, they just, they call it birth deaths or infant mortality. That's right, infant mortality. The increasing tendency for children to come of age without dying means that many agrarian peoples tend to uh, go for just an heir as opposed to an heir and a spare and a spare and a spare and a spare and a spare. And a spare. Like the way nomadic people would make sure that they had enough people to survive the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune is to make sure that you have 10 kids so you get to keep four right that's uh that in many cases is the is the goal now i guess to be morose one has 10 children uh to hope that uh, they survive uh childhood deaths from um from things like uh, suicide and, uh, and gun crimes. 
but that is too morose. So now you come to blows with climatology, right? Uh, you go ahead and humanitarian, humanitarian, humanit, humanit, you, you humanely, that's right. You humanely make sure the quality of life of every people egalitarianly, egal equally across the board around the world, no matter how unable to sustain life sub-Saharan deserts might be or, or deserts or how cyclical famines and even political famines uh, would naturally decimate millions of people, you fill in that vacuum and you supply all necessary resources, including emigration, immigration, um, uh, what refugees, supporting of the movement and the uh, flying, shipping, boating, transporting of refugees to more sustainable areas. You um, you create false populations, right? And now that comes into conflict with the idea that we're non-sustainable as a people and while there is a tendency to for the for the first world to want to actively um, hobble itself a la vis-a-vis -vis, a la uh, Harrison Bergeron where we start clamping down on our um, on our consumption in order to be able to load balance that uh, consumption uh, and, and give it, if you will, donate it abroad. Uh, that's not something that Americans are remotely keen uh, to do, right? You can't, you can't, like, you can't, you need to make people do this, right? Like, maybe Germany might be willing to do it. But the moment it becomes really painful, and the moment it seems less like opt-in than opt-out, I guarantee you even the German people are going to start to grouse. Um... Um, as long as it makes you feel better about yourselves and your contribution to the world, that's fine. But the moment that you start having brownouts, blackouts, you don't have clean water, you don't have access to first world uh, experiences like refrigerators, nice ranges, air conditioning, heating, warm water, hot water, all the water you want. The moment someone starts telling you, uh, you only have to, I mean, they're dealing with certain levels of that in California, right? Um, people who are told that they can't water their lawn, they're told that they need to take 10 minute showers, no baths, uh, so on and so forth. These are things that American balk, Americans balk at, right? So in the competition between humanitarianism and climatism, when does someone start to actively say, we need to shave off billions of people from this population growth in order to take the pressure off of people who have proven that they would more quickly go to their guns than go to their heartstrings and actively cede their first world perceived success and superiority past the point of, uh, of virtue signaling? Like, when do... Um, I'll just say this jokingly. When do World Economic Forum devo devotees to D, uh, to um, uh, Davos, when do Davos tees, when do devotees uh, start giving up their um, Learjets, their Gulf Streams, their other PJs, as the rich people call them? <clears throat> when do they start giving up? their 20,000 uh, square foot air conditioned houses? When do they give up their Olympic sized pools with heating? When do they give up their, um, their floor heating? When do they give up all of those kinds of things? When do they give up heating their houses that they're not in? Um, when do they give up their uh, real cars and their real trucks and their real um, escalades and the escalades they roll with. I don't know. I mean, I don't think they will ever give that up because they believe that their mission and ministry to save the world means that they are on higher orders. 
just like um, when Jesus said, um, just let the woman give me the oil. There will always be the poor. This woman wants to give me expensive oils and I, you know, rock these seamless garments. Come on, man. Give a Messiah a couple luxuries, bro. Like I'm doing the best I can. Like I'm sacrificing my life on your behalf. I feel like these Messiah complexes are something that are um, being shared by the client, uh, climatologists, the climate scientists, and the same people who are trying to convince us that the world is going to have a climate collapse and a population collapse if we don't do this smoothly. Like, um, when is this going to foment uh, a, um, a pandemic that has, you know, 20%, 30%, 50% Thanos level? Thanos level catastrophic repercussions. See, the bad thing about Thanos is that it killed 50% of everybody egalitarianly. I would say that Thanos is an egalitarian. He didn't choose based on gender or race or even, I mean, did he only target sentient beings or did he include uh, mushrooms? And well, that's assuming a mushroom isn't a sentient form of being. But did he include 50% of all potato bugs? Um, I want to know. So, I dare say that humanitarianism and climatology are either at each other's necks, doing things in contravention of each other, um, in aggressive counter uh, counteraction. The humanitarians want everybody to live uh, fruitful, successful, healthy, happy lives. And the climatologists say uh, we need to, by any means necessary, at any cost, um, uh, this is the, this is for the, uh, for this is an existential event. This is an existential climate collapse. This might mean an extinction event for not only our cuddly animal friends, but for, for huge amounts of, of, you know, flora and fauna, as well as our own, um, our own extinction in the near future of, of human beings. So you would assume that, uh, because within 12 years, the world is going to be consumed by the fire of our own making, you'd assume that the climatologists would go en masse to us uh, to, to um, kill, destroy, maim, and jail all the, all the humanitarians of the world, right? To stop them uh, from making sure that we all get our vaccines, that we all get our prenatal vitamins, that we all stop using um, PCBs, that we all stop uh, consuming um, uh, forever chemicals and forever plastics, that we all get our um, COVID vaccines, that we all make sure that we hydrate and that we eat protein and that we uh, make sure that we get our fruits and vegetables and that we um, make sure that we get enough sleep and that we uh, have enough to educate our children and empower our women. That is, seems to be a little bit at odds. Oh, and the people who are um, pursuing the movement of people away from famine areas and deserts and so forth into um, more uh, fertile and uh, fecund areas in, in the north and the south. Um, all these people are trying to keep alive people who in a natural uh, state of the earth in a primitive state, in a uh, liver king uh, paleo state, uh, wouldn't even have the opportunity to be third, fourth generation in their bloodline. They would have expired. Um, like I said, people like me on anti-AFib medicine, on cutting edge, like my heart failure would have killed me without modern uh, sustenance, without modern sustainability, without cardiothoracic doctors without modern medicine, without um, uh, defib and um, 
cardioversion technologies, right? Um, everybody that you know who has rock star eyeglasses, everybody that you know who people who um, uh, have organ transplants would die tomorrow if, uh, if supply lines for those anti-rejection meds didn't exist. So, right? So, we are, most Americans and most people around the world live in a state of temporary existence based on the fact that altruism, technology, and medicine keep us alive for decades and decades longer than we would have otherwise. Um, with regards to transition, transitioning uh, boys and girls to become uh, women and men, uh, those are those are um, medicines that you have to take for the rest of your life. People who have type one diabetes would die almost immediately. Most people with type two diabetes would die. People without dialysis would die. People without their glasses would struggle to survive. People. Um, it's just, it's, it's endless, right? The number of people who are only alive based on the, like my, uh, uh, everybody with dialysis. So all I'm saying is that uh, all we have to do, I guess maybe if there's one nuclear exchange or one um, EMF uh, explosion above the United States and our grid goes down, we know that everybody on dialysis is going to die. We know that if supply lines for uh, sustainable, like my Tychosin or anybody else's like um, medicines that keep them alive, it's just extremely fragile, right? And um, what I'm afraid of is I'm on, I'm on team humanitarian, right? I'm on team humanitarianism. I believe that there's plenty of room for people. And I believe that um, technology innovates towards pain. I believe that um, technology solves pain. I believe that we live in a world that only has 8 billion people because of technology, innovation, um, altruism, um, medicine, science, and, um, and interventionism. I mean, if it weren't for the dastardly plots of most uh, humanitarian and faith-based regimes, I don't know if uh, we would get to the nooks and crannies, right? We always say that these nooks and crannies destroy um, unique uh, First Nation cultures, first village cultures, uh, like people, you know, in uh, the deepest, darkest Amazon and so forth. But those are also people who died at 35, right? We, um, you can maintain your utopia, but there's always a cost for maintaining your utopia and not engaging in uh, the Borg, right? The Borg might remove all your individuality, but the Borg got your back, right? There's a t-shirt, the Borg got your back. And the downside of de Borg got your back is that de Borg considers everything that's not healthy pink flesh to be cancerous. So ideas are cancerous, cancers are cancerous, uh, the Pope's cancerous because he's a different leader, um, uh, Mormonism's cancerous because there's a different leadership. Judaism's always cancerous because they've always been their own tribe within a larger country. Um, Islam is cancerous because there's always Mecca. Um, universities are uh, cancerous because they're oftentimes, except in current history, they're generally heterodox, generally heterodox. So while you might live to being a healthy, fit, vigorous, uh, 120 year old under the Borg, uh, you would better be, um, you'd better be a, uh, obedient Borg. You better be an obedient Borg that don't talk back. So you better be a contributing member to society. You better not be part of the gray or black market. Uh, you better not have a gun. You better not want a gun. Um, and if you really insist on being in, into religion, uh, you probably should be uh, the religion of, the, of your over 
of your overmasters. And that's what I always saw funny. This is a little bit of a divergence and a hint on the next conversation. Have you noticed that um, in a modern human, uh, humanist world of, um, of uh, atheists, that there is a huge amount of hatred towards Christianity? It's called, in many cases, Christo-fascism. That be whether that's, you know, any type of white church, so-and-so. But did you notice on this, at the same moment, African-American Christian church, Korean Christian church, certainly Latino, Latina, Latinx Christian church, um, uh, Ethiopian Orthodox church, uh, Lithuanian, 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 any type of Orthodox church or anything that adorbs or cute or charming or primitive or, you know, interesting or curious or um, que interesante are perfectly fine. Like people consider, you know, black Christian churches to be these beautiful, amazing, culturally important in the community thing. Whereas the same thing, if it were Baptist or latin catholic or whatever those are considered um awful awful trump pulpits that will result in a uh, christo fascist theocratic state doesn't make any sense to me i believe that um it's mostly a power thing right um because they really don't believe uh they really don't believe that anybody in a black church in a latino church in a even a, a Muslim uh, um, place, uh, or even a, a a Jewish temple, a Mormon temple, Mormon. I'm going to. I'm sorry. Assalamu alaikum. Um, clerics temples I'm sorry complete brain fart but anyway people who don't have power can do their amusing culturally unique charming thing and tourists will want to go and see how charming that's why churches in Italy and Spain and anywhere but America you can go to Catrida, Catri, Catidra, Catedral in Latin America, Spain, Portugal, um, Italy, and those are just charming relics of a different age. But, you know, St. P- Peter's Basilica might be considered to be a crypto-fascistic HQ. I don't know. Um, oh, book, book uh, recommendation is... Um, oh, I don't know. I don't have a book recommendation this week. I think I'm done. I think that I wonder how how the humanists and how the climatists agree or disagree and what the end game is because I do believe that the humanists do want to empower women to stop having kids. But um, the West can't even convince its uh, its own people, you know, to stop believing in a non-existent Christ figure, a non-existent God, a a sky daddy. They can't even convince their their rural peoples to not believe in sky daddy and to not have ten kids and to not be anti-abortion. There's no way that they're going to be able to convince uh, anybody outside of Kabul to do these things. Anybody outside of you know, maybe Addis Ababa to do these kinds of things. And don't worry about Ethiopia, man. Those are very observant Eastern Orthodox Christian and Jewish people. They keep their, they keep their knees closed, man. Um, but, uh, but, you know, rural people everywhere, they don't have all that much to do. They're healthy. They don't care about being professionals they don't care about their career they just care about bringing home the bacon and they care about loving their families and they care about entertainment and they care about fornication 
And if I sound loopy, it's because I think I'm coming down with an ear infection. So it's annoying, it's an, annoying the bejesus out of me. Anyway, have a good day. I'll talk to you soon. Aloha and mahalo. This was episode five, episode eight, season five. Talk to you soon. This is the Chris Abraham Show. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.